in the previous video, we created a React project from scratch. And we built a template like the one that we're using for, for the Academy students is this one. We built it from scratch using Byte. You can see that here in what we built, we have the Byte config. So we use Byte as a module bundler to create our template. And we ended up having uh, a styles folder with all the styles of our application, a JS folder with the main, the JSX, that has uh, just like the little basics, the bare minimum of what you need for a uh, React application. We use Bootstrap because it's still the, the mo most used uh, framework in the world for front end, for CS for styling. And then we just have one home, home, little home. And it was a very simple architecture. It was fine. It works. I recommend using it. But it's time to get serious. It's time to get serious. We're going to do now a more senior, scalable architecture. So I want to go over a few concepts first here. So our priority in the last video was to making the website load fast, right? We want to load fast. And that's why we focus a lot in using Byte or you could use Webpack if you want, but any model bundler, because we want basically uh, this is the timeline of your website on how, how long it takes to load. Let's say it takes two, two milliseconds to load. So what we want, what we want is to lower this amount of milliseconds, right? We want to lower that. So in order to do so, we have to reduce the amount of things that we load, obviously, right? So which are the things that we load? Well, we're always loading either link tags, we're loading script tags, we're loading images, so the alternative or, or, or the solution for this was basically using a model bundler that will merge all your CSS files into just one file that is called the bundle CSS and all your JS files into one file that is called the bundle.js. And as you can see here, since we don't have that many steps anymore, before we had one resource, another resource, we had four resources. Each of them will take about 100 milliseconds. And then obviously the time that it takes for the browser to render the website. But now we only have two pieces because we have this one and then we have uh, the JavaScript. So obviously it takes way less. That's how it works. But maybe you're thinking, yeah, but the amount of code, if you merge these two files together, the amount of code is still the same, but it's now only in one file. But that's not true either because Another thing that model bundlers do is that they will, after they bundle all together, they basically compress that file and they provide you now with a compressed bundle that it's really hard to read for a human, but it still contains the same original code, but compressed. The same happens with the JavaScript. It will compress it and it will end up having just one little JavaScript file with way less uh, characters because it's compressed. And that's what you see on a website. Sometimes when you open a website, you will see that it has a bunch of gibberish, like it's impossible to understand. I think maybe maybe if you go to the 4 Geeks Academy website and you look at the source code, you will find it that way. Let's see if we, if we can find one of the JavaScripts. Here it is, look, this is a compressed JavaScript. You see, it's all, it's a JavaScript file. You can see, you can still recognize some functions like function here or the, the variable. You can still recognize some words, but in general, the variables are now single letters because now the priority is not to make it readable for humans, it's to make it small. So they compress the bundles. Okay, so, but when you do a, an application that you want it to scale, you, you worry not only on making the application fast to load, but you also focus a lot on these priorities here. So what I'll be explaining in the next few minutes is how our boilerplate, our template that we're building now, it's going to have environments, it's going to have routing and multiple pages, layout and navigation, organized data structures, and it's going to share data among, con among components. So I'm going to just explain each of them. I may stop the video in the middle 
and uh, record again sometimes because I want to make sure that every single of the explanations is super well properly explained. Okay, so let's talk about environments for a second. So why do we need environments? When you're building a template that is going to be used for a big project in React, you want to make sure that every developer is able to interact with that template in a, in a smooth, seamless way. So if developer number one has a Python computer, uh, a computer with Python 3.10 and it has Windows, but developer number two has Python 3.11 and it has Mac OS, that's a problem already. So environments come come in into the formula to save you from that problem. The idea is that the code that you download from GitHub, that it's going to contain your actual project, can be properly used by both without any changes. They can just run it and it will run. So how do you make sure that when they run it, it runs smoothly? So imagine this is the piece of code that you are downloading from GitHub. This piece of code, it's just a fetch. It's just a, a request that is getting from an API, uh, the to, a to-do list, imagine. So when this person, when this person, it's uh, coding on its computer, it will run it locally, right? So probably the API will be something like localhost API 3000, something like that. But this other person is running it on their own computer. So maybe for this person is running in localhost API 6000. So the API URL that you are requesting to get those to do's is different in this computer than in this one. So what you're going to do, instead of hard coding, instead of hard coding your API host, you're going to convert it into an environmental variable. And an environmental variable, it's something that you put in your template. So let me start by downloading the template because I haven't. I'm going to download the template that I already built instead of building it from scratch, and I'm going to explain it. There it is. So this is the template. So give me a second to get inside. Okay. So this is this is the template that I downloaded from GitHub, the, the one that I have prepared. It has the same by config. If you compare it with the previous one, it's very similar. It has, and if you don't know about these files, I recommend watching the previous video because I'm not going to explain them all over again. I'm going to explain only the differences. And the differences are not outside here. Are only The only differences are inside the source folder. So, well, and the EMB, my bad, that is outside of the source folder, this one, the EMB example. You see this EMB example here? EMV is short for environment. So what you want to do is that you want to grab this example and you want to create your own ENV. You're going to copy that file and you're going to rename it and you're going to only call it ENV. And this is a standard. When you get hired as a developer, you'll see that all companies do the same. The EMB file is where you are going to define that API host that I was referring to. So let's say that it's going to be localhost 3000. It doesn't matter. Like it's whatever you your API host will be tomorrow. If you don't know, then don't worry about it. Just just put ASD, ASD, ASD for now. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the concept that the variable will contain inside the URL of your API. So once you put it here, then you can come into your code and you can look for any API call. For example, let me grab that code that I was um, that I was showing here. This one. I'm gonna grab this code and I'm gonna paste it in my actual application. Let's call this get to do's, and I'm gonna paste it here. So this function here const get to do's equals this function will get all the to do's from a to do's api right so instead of putting api host like this i'm going to remove this and i'm going to use a magic word that you can use to retrieve the api host from the environment and you do something like 
you do something like I'm gonna say here const API host and I'm gonna paste the environment variable retrieval code that is like this. It's import.meta.emb dot the actual variable name. So API host in this case. We're just gonna put here API. If you see how it said mode before, well that's only if you have a mode variable here, mode, whatever. But if you don't have a mode variable, you don't have to have a mode. It's whatever the variable name you have. So API host will be, in our case, API host. What I'm doing there is that I'm retrieving from the EMB, I am retrieving the API host. And then that API host will be uh, attached into my actual code from now on. But if, going back to the to the drawing. If the API host, the and the .env file for this person, it's different than the one from this one, then the API host will be different because it's coming from the EMB file. And that's super cool. So that's how environmental variables work. I don't want to explain the rest of an environment because I only wanted to focus on the EMB file. That's what matters. But you can also, you can also save into the EMB passwords Key, API keys, things like that, because the EMB file will not get committed into GitHub. So as you can see here, if I say git status, it doesn't recognize any changes in my code. That means that git hasn't, git will ignore completely the EMB file. It doesn't matter if I make changes on it. They will never be committed into GitHub. So that's great because if you have a password that you want to store, you can because it will not be it will not be sent to GitHub in the source code. That's how you protect your secrets, your passwords, your API keys and stuff. But beware that this this will protect them only from GitHub. When you're in production and you're running your website since everything is front end the hackers or whoever has bad intentions will still be able to see your your environmental variables being used in production. So this only works for a security measure for GitHub. It will not upload your keys into GitHub. Okay, so that's environmental variables. So now now let's talk about the second concept that it's routing and pages. So another thing that happens in a uh, more mature application that scales is that you have multiple URLs in the same application. Like you could have a login page, you can have a sign up page, you can have a home page. So when you have multiple pages, React was not built for doing multiple pages. React was built to re-render a component. So the solution for that that we chose in the academy was it's a library called React Router. What React, says, what React Router says is that you're going to have now a new component called the router, and they will provide this component for you. And this router will hide two of these at a time. It will only show one at a time. So, for example, only sign up, depending on the URL. If the URL changes, then it will stop showing sign up. And now, let's say it may, it may only show login it will hide entirely one of the components. And let me show you how it's done. The router component, it's here in the source routes. Here, I am importing from React Router DOM, I'm importing this, these three functions here. And the first one is to create the browser router because this can be used for other applications that don't run on a browser. So we are using a browser. It's going to be a web application. So we're going to use a create browser router function. And then we call the other function that's called create route from elements. And then what matters, this will always stay the same. So you don't even, you just have to copy paste it and that's it. What matters is that you do understand how this part works. Uh, how this work works is that, let me remove this. There it is. And let me remove this as well. There you go. We have three routes here. Look, we have single, demo, and slash. I want to use the same uh, the same example, but I don't have a login. Imagine, imagine you have a login here, like this, like in the example, right? Login. What was the other one? It's uh, sign up and home. 
So sign up. And then home. This one is home, but I'm not going to put home because it's redundant. Like the actual root, your path. So what this means is that if I'm in a browser and I type, if I'm in a browser and I type the application URL, let's say it's called localhost or whatever, your application. If I'm in a router and I type localhost 8000 or whatever your application is running, and then I put slash login, what that means is that this component will show up, the, the single component. The other two will be hidden. This one will be hidden, and this one will be hidden. Only one at a time can be shown. Okay, so that's that's how you route. And then, obviously, you can put whatever you want on the single component. You can put hello world here, and it's going to show up hello world. So that's how routing works. But then there's another problem. Like What happens if you want to have a layout? Because we're talking about routing and layouts. A layout is when you have on a website, all websites have layouts. Like, for example, if if you go to the uh, 4gigs.com website, you will see that this website has a layout. We have an app bar on the top. This navigational bar has the logo and it has all these links. It has my avatar when I'm logged in for changing the languages. And then it has a footer as well. Here it is. All of this is the footer. It has about the company, a media kit, uh, a bunch of other pages and stuff. And what changes, that will remain the same all the time. What changes is the middle, like the actual content of the website. So if, for example, if I if I just choose to see this landing page for the full style development course, the app bar is still the same, the footer is still the same, but everything else changed. So how do you do something like that? In a, in a big application, you need to do that. You need to be able to do something like that. So what React Router is, uh, tells you is that you have, you're going to have now another component that we're going to be calling the outlet. The outlet basically is the area of your website that will always change no matter the route. It's a component. It's a component that will contain everything that changes in your website. And the nav bar and the footer, they don't change, right? So they're not part of your outlet. They will be separate components. So how do, how do that, how does that translate into code? You, you're going to see here that I have on the top a layout component. And that's, it's here on pages, layout. So the layout has a nav bar an outlet and the footer. The nav bar is mine. I coded the nav bar. It's here. Here's the nav bar. I can put here my links and I can do the HTML for my nav bar. I can also do the HTML from my footer, but I cannot do the HTML from the outlet. The outlet is a component that you bring from React Router, from React Router. Here it is. You see? So that's what matters, that when you're building your route, you have to do the layout, and then you actually have to do the routes that change on every URL. But the layout will remain the same. And for the layout, you need a, an outlet. So to summarize, you're going to have, when you're building React applications with React Router, you're always going to have to have an outlet and import it. You're going to have a layout, and you're going to put whatever you want on the top and on the bottom of the outlet as long as the outlet remains in the middle. Or it doesn't matter, like your layout is different, could be different, but you know what I mean. Okay, so that's how you do layout and we also took care of navigation. So now we're missing organizing our data and sharing the data among applications. We already know about the use state, that it's uh, the most popular hook in React. It came with it from day one, basically. But now we have also the use reducer. I want to go over the use reducer as well because it's really important. We're going to be using it on this particular architecture. The use reducer, it's similar to the use state in the way that it's going to have a state and the state uh, concept stays the same. And every time you modify the state, it will also refresh the component. 
But now the reducer will come, will force you to declare a reducer function. And the reducer function works in a very specific way. So you can think about the use reducer like a more opinionated state. It's a, it forces you to always have a switch statement with all your actions in there. Uh, there's a video about that. I'm going to put the link in the description because I already explained properly the use reducer. So I don't want to explain it again. I'm going to cover it a little bit, but I do want to focus on how you use them to scale an application. So in this case, I'm going to be building or we're going to be building or building a resume application that is going to have two pages. It's going to have a candidate where there's a list of all the resumes, and then it's going to have a single resume page that is going to have resume number one, resume number two. It doesn't matter which resume as long as it's one resume. Okay, so for that, uh, we're going to be using the use reducer because that's the most popular way of building a state or modifying, updating, and enforcing a state in a React application these days. But we're going to be using it only for the global store of the application. Before, your application never had a global store. Now, in this template, it's going to have a global store. And what is the global store? Well, basically, if you think about if you think only about the state and you focus only on one component in one page, the state of this page, it's going to have a list of resumes, right? This is the candidates page. It's going to have a list of resumes and it's going to be in a local state here. You're going to use the use state. You're going to put all the resumes in there and your resumes probably are going to have a structure like this. Each of them will, it's going to be something like this. It's going to be a resumes array. And then your resumes array will have every single resume. So this particular resume starts here and ends here. And it has an ID and a full name, an email, and the experiences. So that's one, that's that's the state, the proposed state for a candidate's view. But now if you are going to have a resume, a, a single resume view, you don't need an array of resumes, right? You can just have one single resume that it's going to, that's going to be your state. Your whole state is going to be a single resume here, the local state. And that's normal. That, that's what you already know. But what, what is changing in this particular architecture that we're proposing is that now you have a state that is shared between both, between both pages. And that state is what we call the store. So the store will be shared among both. And it will replicate and it, it, it will be shared every time the store changes, both components will re-render as well. And why do we need that? Well, because sharing uh, sharing data between pages is impossible without it. We need a global store now. And how are we going to be implementing that? So now we the the, the these three minutes, this last three minutes has been about the structure that you need and the organization. But how are we going to be sharing those that data between both pages? That's now about uh, sharing, right? This part here sharing data among components. Okay, so that's how is that going to work? We're going to be using something we call global reducer. So it's like the same reducer that you already know. And if you don't know it, you should watch that video and then come back to this video and continue watching. It's going to it's gonna be a, a reducer like always, but it's going to be global. So we're going to always call it global reducer. So Every time each of these views wants to change, not the local state, because when you change to change the local state, all you do is assess state. But every time you want to change the global state to, to modify the list of resumes for the whole application, you are going to be using the dispatcher from the global use reducer, the dispatcher. And then in that dispatcher, you're going to specify the, the type of dispatching that you're doing or the action and the payload that is needed. So the same way that the use reducer has a reduce function, the global use reducer also has it. And the, use, and the reducer function, it's going to receive that information from the dispatcher or from it, it's going to do the transformations it needs to do to update the store and it's going to send the new version of the store to the store so that then it can be replicated and propagated to all the views all over again. So every single view that uses the store will 
received the, this update, even though maybe the resume number three was updated only since the dispatcher was called. So when the dispatcher was called, it will update the entire store and the entire store will be replicated all over again to every single page, to every single page, even those that don't need it. Maybe there's a particular page that is not going to be using this particular information. It's, it doesn't show anything about the resume number three that was updated, but it will still get the new store if, it's, if the hook is being used in that view. Okay, so now let's see it in the code. To see it in the code, we have here, this would be the candidates view, the page, my bad, but I'm going to rename it to resumes because that's how I had it before. And I don't want to mess anything up. So we have, instead of candidates, it's going to be resumes in plural. That's a list of resumes. And then the, re the single resume that uses the ID as a parameter. So that would be resume number one, number two, number three, doesn't matter. It's going to have an ID on the, on the URL of the actual page. And then we have the layout. It doesn't have anything new. It's just basically, I'm gonna uh, remove this one. And this one doesn't have much either. So I'm just gonna remove it as well, this, this uh, particular file, because as long as you understand that it's gonna have a resume with an ID and then the list of resumes, that's what matters. It will connect into these two components. The first is a single resume. And the second one would be the entire resume list. So I'm just gonna keep both open because they do matter a lot, but I'm gonna close the route. And then I'm gonna obviously open the store. And that's pretty much it, I think. Um, yeah, we already talked about routes, we talked about main. Yeah, so I'm gonna fo be focusing on the store and how the use reducer will be used for a global store. Let me collapse this. Let me leave the store here open. Okay, so the store that we're proposing, if we're gonna have a list of resumes, obviously the global store, it's gonna be the entire list of resumes. So it's an array where each item inside the array is one single resume. So in this case, it has a name, email, and a list of experiences. And then to modify that store or the reducer for that, remember in the diagram that we have a store, that we propose, and then we also have a reducer function. So the reducer function will receive the state and a second parameter with type and payload. And here it is. Uh, for us, is a global state that we call the store. And the action here is going to have a type and a payload. And you can see how I'm deconstructing the payload from here, and I'm accessing the type from here. So action type and then action payload. So it has both that we discussed. It has action type and action payload, it has both. And then it has the state that for us is gonna be called the store. So here's the store. And then we do a switch statement and this will always be like that. If you have used before the use, the use reducer, you will know with a case where, or several cases where we are going to be doing everything we want, like update the resume or delete resume, and then the other one can be insert resume. It doesn't matter. You have one case statement for each action that you want to do it into your data. We only have one action because I wanted to do the simplest possible application. And so my action is called update resume. And it will, opt, it will look for the resume in the list and it will update it, the given, the given resume. Okay, so... Let's um, see it in action for a second. So here's the application running. It's, you can click on the list of resumes and here's John Doe. It's only one resume right now. John Doe that we saw it on the actual, um, on the actual uh, code. Here it is, John Doe. And the experience, it's working on ABC Inc for three years. So you can see, John Doe, when you click on it, you can see that it's working for ABC three years. That's the experience. But we could, for example, add a new experience. So when you add a new experience, what you're really doing is that you're updating the local state of the application. The local state, okay? The local state. I'm not going to, if I add an experience into a resume, I'm not going to modify the store yet. I'm going to do it in a local scope. I'm going to focus only on the resume ID page. And here, 
I'm going to have a local state. And in that local state, I'm going to let me grab the local state, this one. And let me put it here. So I'll grab this local state and I will update the experience in this particular in this particular state, not in the global one. OK, so that's what I'm doing here. Look, when when you hit an add. When you hit an add, let me show you the resume, the single resume. The button to add is this one. What I'm doing is add experience. That's what I'm doing, right? And what is the function add experience doing? Well, it's setting a local state. Look, set resume data, it's here. I have a local state with the resume data locally in my local page. And I'm just resetting the resume data in my local page. What am I resetting? Well, I'm saying I want the resume information for this person to be whatever it was before. But on the experiences, I want to have a new array that contains whatever all the experiences were before, but with the addition of one more company. Like that, one more company. And it's going to be an empty company with, an, with a zero amount of years, because then I will have to take care of actually updating it. So we're going to do that as well. Let, let's update it. Once I click Add, I can put here, I don't know, like Disney. And I can say that Disney was for five years. So basically, I'm modifying the empty experience that was given before. And when I do that, why am I modifying that? Uh, how? Well, by because this is looping in my in my page. I am looping resume data experiences. I am looping them, and for each of them, I'm putting three elements: an input for the company, an input for the amount of years, and a button to delete it. And that's what you see here. Look, an input for the company, an input for the amount of years, and an input to delete it. So each of them, each resume will have with those three elements, each experience, my bad. So when you add a new experience, well, you're just adding into this array. So it will loop one more, and it will show that one more. But it's going to be empty because I set it up as empty. Look, it's an empty company with an empty amount of years. But then when, when I update the experience, you can see here that when you start typing on company, like we did, if you start typing on company like we did with Disney, it will, every time you hit the input and you change it, it's going to update that particular experience and it's going to reset the company. So that's more like basic use data stuff. But now you can see that I'm only updating locally because if I go to the main page and I click on John Doe again, Disney is not there anymore, you see? Disney is not there. So what that means is that I'm modifying the local, I am modifying the local state here, but I'm not modifying the global one. So when I go back to candidates or to resumes, to the list of resumes, and then come back, that information is lost. Why is it lost? Because it's not being shared among all the components. You need to share them among all, all the components so that when you come back, it's still there. OK, so how do we do that with the with the use uh, global reducer? So here it is. Um, aside from aside from using the state, I'm also using the global reducer. Here it is. So remember that you have to dispatch if you want to use the global reducer. So that's what I'm going to do when you hit the button save this button here at the bottom. It's going to save everything into the main store, the global store. So let's just do it again. I'm going to put now, instead of Disney, let's just do Microsoft. And then I'm going to say that it's 10, seven years of experience Microsoft, of experience. And I'm going to hit save. Now that I hit save, if I go back to the list of resumes and I click on Jundo, it's going to still be there. You see, it's still there. So that means that the save button worked. And what is the save button doing? It's dispatching. Look, here it is. Here's the save button. It's dispatching with two parameters, type and payload, like we discussed. Look, the type and the payload. And what is the type? Well, in this case, is update resume, right? Let me see. Update resume. There it is. And the payload, the resume data that I was that I had in a local state. Now I'm gonna make it into the global state. I'm gonna put it into the global state. So I'm just passing the entire resume data. When the dispatch gets called, if we follow the flow. Then the use reducer function will receive it. So let's go to the use reducer function. Here it is, the store reducer. And it's going to get 
the new store and the action that we pass with the type. And here's a switch that is choosing for the type. And then we update the type is update resume that matches this one. Look, it matches. So it will say, okay, cool. Give me the idea of that new that resume that you want to update. And it's going to say, okay, from all the resumes, I want to loop them all. And if the resume, it's um, the one that I was given as a payload, then replace it with the payload. If not, leave it as the same. And that's how you update the whole resume at once. So that's basically it. Now that you think about it, it's not that hard to create an architecture that scales. In our application, just to go to finish what we were uh, discussing, we already have environments, so we can protect our data and we can make sure that if we have many developers, all of them will be able to work with their own secrets, with their own APIs, with their own stuff without changing the code. Then we have multiple routes and pages. We have a, a layout with an app bar and a footer that it's uh, shared among all the pages in the, in, the, in, the, in the project. We have an organized data in a single global store, and then we're replicating that locally by sharing using the use global reducer into every component and using the dispatcher to make changes into the global store. And that's basically a, a, a template. If you look at you, if you look it up uh, on the files here on the left, you will see that from the previous one we only have little changes. We have a store now that it's going to be this file that contains the initial store with the structure that you want, a reducer that will contain all your reducing fun uh, the reducing function with all your actions that you have to basically duplicate if you want to do more things like update the resume, delete the resume, or whatever you want to do. You have routes because you didn't have it before because before we didn't have multiple pages. Now we have them. And you have the main that the only line of code that I haven't explained is the store provider here that is basically using the, the use global reducer. It's still, it's still the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm using a, a design pattern called consumer producer that it's been um, under the hood. We're using the context API for that. Uh, but that's uh, not a lot of lines of code either. Look, if you look at the code, it's very simple. It's also super small code. To replicate that the context API is the one doing the replication of the information among all the components. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I hope you guys like it. This is how you scale an application. This is how you build an architecture that scales.